Okay, thank you. Please. Are we, are we good? Uh, okay. Now, where's my version? So, um, I don't know, is everybody able to see uh, this page announcing who I am? I can see the page. Okay, good. And you see the cursor? Yes. Oh, okay, good. All right. So, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, Alberto and Alessandro for this uh, kind invitation. And I'm going to talk about the alternate interpretation of the fourth order theories to the two previous speakers, namely not dealing with negative energy so much as dealing with states which have negative Dirac norm. Now the problem goes back as far as the Pauli Villars regulator theory and it's a 70 year old ghost problem. They were looking at uh, graphs like this and they wanted to do two things. They wanted to implement gauge invariance and they also wanted to regulate asymptotic divergences. Uh, this graph is quadratically divergent, and with the second term here, it would become log divergent. Now, Pauli and Villars in 1949 recognized that this was just a mathematical procedure, but in their paper they said they did not want to rule out that it might be physical. They actually considered that possibility. As they produced it, you have to have two actions for two scalar fields, but you have to have one of them uh, with, a, with a negative minus sign in the completeness relation. And when you insert equation three into the propagator, into this propagator, then you are led to uh, equation one. So as far as they were concerned, uh, ghosts can reduce asymptotic divergences, but at the price of the loss of probability as seen in this minus sign and the loss of unitarity. Okay. Now, in 1950, Pison and Uhlenbeck asked the question, well, could in fact this theory be physical after all? And they replaced the two field action by a one field fourth order derivative action, which is of this form here with the fourth derivative, equation of motion given by six, and propagator given by one over k squared minus m squared minus one over k squared minus m two squared, which you can write in partial fractions to have exactly the Pauli Villars form multiplied by this factor one over m one squared minus m two squared. So they said, look, we can get the same propagator from a fourth order theory. However, something bad happens. And to see what bad is happening, if you quantize the theory, you can simply forget about space derivatives and restrict to time derivatives by fixing the momentum, spatial momentum this way. And then this action that they started with reduces to what's called the Pice Uhlenbeck, the PU action. And it contains Z double dot squared, Z dot squared, and Z squared. And um, this is an action that has been studied by uh, many people, uh, including um, some of today's speakers and our hosts, uh, Alberto and Alessandro. Now, I and Aaron Davidson looked at this theory uh, some time ago, and we realized the following. We have a Z, a Z dot, and a Z double dot. That's too many canonical variables for one oscillator, but not enough for two. So it's a constrained system. So we introduced an x equals z dot, and either using the method of Ostrogrodsky, the method of Dirac constraints, which is what we used, or simply covariantizing the action and varying with respect to the metric, one obtains this particular Hamiltonian with canonical commutators, zpz is i, xpx is i. So this is the Hamiltonian of the theory. And the bad news is because of this minus sign, the energy spectrum is unbounded from below. That's the Ostrogrodsky instability and its characteristic of higher derivative theories. So let's see what this means uh, for the quantum theory. Can we trade the energy instability for a ghost 
And when I use the term ghost, I'm always going to mean states of negative norm in the quantum theory. In the 1950s, Lee, Chalen, and Pauli and Heisenberg reopened the ghost issue, and they discovered that there was a way to avoid negative energies. You make the standard substitutions, and you obtain a Hamiltonian and commutator algebra of the form I've indicated here. And the important thing to notice is that the A2, A2 dagger commutator has a minus sign. And also note, which we'll come back to, is that when omega one is equal to omega two, this decomposition is singular, but then way back at the beginning, that's the same singularity when you set M1 equals M2, and we will discuss that shortly. So, you have the Hamiltonian, you have the commutator. Let's take omega one is greater than omega two. Two possible realizations, define the vacuum that A1 and A2 both annihilate. Then you discover the energy is unbounded from below. The ground state energy has energy omega one plus omega two, but the excited state A2 dagger on the vacuum that lies above omega two has a Dirac norm that is negative because of this minus sign. However, something's gone wrong. How, this expression cannot possibly be negative because it's a modular squared, unless this dagger will not in fact mean Hermitian. So for this to be the case, something must not be Hermitian, and we will see in a moment that this is the case. Now, the alternate realization the alternate realization is to take a two dagger to annihilate the vacuum. Then you take care of the minus sign. Now the theory is free of negative norm states, but the energy spectrum is unbounded from below. Namely, negative energy states propagate forwards in time. However, whether you use one realization or the other, for in all cases, the eigenvalues of this Hamiltonian are all real. And this will also prove to be very important. Okay. So the PU theory as written suffers from one of two twin diseases, negative norms or negative energies. Since defining the vacuum by setting A2 vacuum is zero or by setting A2 dagger vacuum equals zero, a correspond to working in two totally different Hilbert spaces, in no single Hilbert space does one have both diseases, though in either one, there is still a seemingly irrefutable problem. The purpose of this talk is not a way to cancel the ghost states in the A2 dagger realization, but to show that the reasoning that leads one to think that there is a ghost is faulty. Thus the work of Carl Bender and I never gets rid of the ghosts, but shows that they were never there in the first place, never gets rid of the states of negative norm. Now, the alternate realization, A2 dagger equals zero, has been studied some time ago by Smilger. Uh, this is the one with the negative energies, and we've just heard two very nice talks on how you could possibly live with the negative energies. The issue from the point of view of quantum field theory is these negative energy states are propagating forwards in time, namely, they are below the real axis in the Feynman contour, and you have to find a way to move them from the negative energy region into the positive energy region, or get them to cross the contour so that they're no longer in the Feynman contour that closes below the real axis. So those, I think, are the quantum field theory challenges associated with this realization. Now, why would we think, in principle, that there could be something wrong with the argument that we've just discussed. The answer is, suppose you have a propagator. A propagator is a C number. And from a C number, you can't construct the underlying Hilbert space. You can, of course, construct the C number matrix elements from the Q number theory, but not the other way around. So knowing a C number doesn't tell you unambiguously what the quantum field theory is, and therefore the task is to find the relevant quantum Hilbert space and to find a relevant positive definite inner product that would replace the standard Dirac norm. 
Now, the other place where this comes up is already mentioned in the two previous talks. The Einstein-Hilbert action is very interesting theory, of course. However, quantum mechanically, it leads to uncontrollable quadratic divergences. Um, there is another kind of theory, which is a renormalizable gravity theory, which is based on the fourth order theory. Um, this gives rise, instead of a one over k squared, it gives a one over k to the four pro uh, propagator, which is logarithmic and thus renormalizable. And this is the conformal gravity action that I'll come back to in a few moments. A hybrid, which was basically motivated by the original discussion of Pauli and Villars, the hybrid is to have both the second order and the fourth order, and then exactly you get this particular propagator. Um, these theories are very much in vogue, as, as we've heard about this morning, and recently there was a whole conference at CERN on this very, very topic. The reason is they give a renormalizable theory of quantum gravity, no string theory, no extra dimensions, and what may now be emerging as a plus, no need for supersymmetry. But this is all very good, but what about the ghosts? We appear to be at an impasse. A theory that was developed by Carl Bender uh, starting in 1998 called PT symmetry, which I'll explain shortly, uh, turns out to do the job. What Lee, did, Lee introduced a model <clears throat> in this period when people were first looking at the issue of negative norms in the 1950s. In this model, you could do coupling constant renormalization and analytically, you could get an expression relating the Burr coupling and the renormalized coupling. It was found that the states contain ghost states, namely states of negative Dirac norm, for a certain range of values of the renormalized coupling. And that for those values, the Burr coupling constant became complex. In consequence, in that region, the theory was not a Hermitian theory. And if it's not a Hermitian theory, then the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian because the coupling constant is complex, you can't use as the norm or the inner product the overlap of a ket state with its Hermitian conjugate bra. So that the disease was that you use the Dirac norm in a place where it couldn't be applicable because the, the theory was not Hermitian. They found instead that the theory had an anti-linear P symmetry, that PT symmetry, this is the work of Bender, Brandt, Chen, and Wang, and that yet when you use the PT theory norm, the overlap of a ket with its PT conjugate, one finds that this norm is indeed positive definite. Now, in my opinion, solving the Lee model ghost problem this way is a considerable triumph for PT theory. And I'll explain a bit later on what PT theory means. Thus, in general, if you find states of negative Dirac norm, it does not necessarily mean that the theory is not unitary. It could mean that one is in the wrong Hilbert space and that one is using the wrong inner product, the Dirac one, with a different inner product, the PT one, being unitary. So now what about Pauli Villars? So can we apply the ideas of Bender and colleagues to the Pauli Villars theory? Here's the Hamiltonian that we had before. So now it looks as though everything is real, so it doesn't look like there is any problem of hermeticity. However, we now solve the Schrodinger equation. We set PZs minus IDZ and so on. Here's the Schrodinger equation. And now we calculate the ground state wave function. And the ground state wave function diverges as plus Z squared. That means it's not normalizable. And that means that the vacuum is not normalizable either. And therefore using this completeness relation cannot be valid because that presupposed that the states were normalizable. So that's where the flaw is, is assuming that the states were normalizable. However, rather than being a bad thing, namely having non-renormalizable non states, it's the lack of normalizability that will actually save the theory. How do you make the theory normalizable? You have to continue Z into the complex plane. Now, the simplest way to do this is to make a similarity transformation. Z goes to minus IZ, Q goes to IPZ, and then the Hamiltonian takes this form, P squared minus IQX plus X squared plus Y squared, 
And under a similarity transformation, we now see the minus sign, and now we know the theory is not Hermitian. However, similarity transformations can't change energy eigenvalues. Therefore, if the energy eigenvalues are already real, they stay real. And so hermeticity is seen as only being sufficient to give real eigenvalues, but not necessary. And indeed, and I'll give you the proof in a moment, the theory has an antilinear PT symmetry, and under the PT symmetry, all the energy eigenvalues are real. But now what do we do with the minus IQX? Well, we make a second uh, similarity transformation. We introduce an operator Q, we apply it to H, and we obtain an action P squared plus Q squared plus X squared plus Y squared. This is a completely standard two-dimensional oscillator system. We know the norms are positive definite, but going from the theory with H to the theory with H prime, from N to N prime, the phase E to the minus Q2 is not minus IQ2, so it's not a unitary operator. So what we start out with is a theory in a skew basis, which we transform into an orthonormal basis. And therefore, if N prime N prime is delta MN, which of course we know is so, then N e to the minus QM is delta MN. And therefore, the inner product is not NM, where the Ns and the Ns would be the eigenstates of the original H prime. Let me just go back one second. The N and M would have been the eigenstates of this, of this action, of this Hamiltonian. Rather, the norm is N e to the minus QM. Now, it turns out, and I'll just state the result, that this is the same as the overlap of a state with its PT conjugate rather than this one, which is the overlap with its Hermitian conjugate. The inner product is positive definite, and therefore the PU oscillator theory and the pauli villas propagator theory are fully viable theories. When omega-1 equals omega-2, the Q operator becomes undefined. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The PU theory, just mentioned, has also been studied by two of our hosts, by uh, Alberto and Alessandro. But now you have to ask, well, where did the minus sign go? <laughs> if, if there's a minus sign here, how can, it not, how can it disappear? The answer is, you've got the wrong quantum matrix element. The quantum matrix element has to have the extra e to the minus q. When you put that state, when you put this operator in, Carl and I then showed that, that you use this correct uh, incompleteness relation, you insert it into here, and then you generate that propagator. So the mistake was because we've always used vacuum T phi phi vacuum as the propagator before we'd shown it to be so, when you're in a non Hermitian theory, it's not the right one. The right one is with this extra e to the minus q. So that was the error. You, got, you mis miscalculated what was going to be the correct propagator in the first place. You can go from the Q number to the C number theory, but not the other way around. So Carl and I's conclusion, we never got rid of the ghost. We show that it was not there in the first place, and it was just faulty reasoning to think that this propagator is necessarily associated with this matrix element. Now, what happens in loops? So now we go to loops, and you immediately realize that in loops, you have this minus sign, and you'll get a discontinuity across here that is negative, and that absolutely violates unitarity. But we can't violate unitarity, because if the free theory is unitary, in perturbation theory, you can't change the signature of the Hilbert space, therefore something else has to happen. Now we go back and we make this transformation, the one I just showed you with the e to the q, but now if we put in an interaction, then the interaction transforms in this way, and that means, rather peculiarly, that the tree approximation graph gets modified, and it's only the sum of the two that is unitary. In other words, the discontinuity across here with the negative sign is cancelled by an extra contribution from the tree approximation, and a similar idea has been explored by uh, Damiano Anselmi, um, who's also discussed the possibility that the tree approximation is a lot more complicated than we think it is. 
very quickly, what is antilinear symmetry? If you take h psi equals e psi, you multiply by some general operator a, you get a h a to minus one a is e star a. Then if a h a to minus one is h, then h a psi is e star psi, and the energies are either real or in complex conjugate pairs. So if you have an antilinear symmetry, energies are real or in complex conjugate pairs, uh, I was able to show that antilinearity is necessary for all eigenvalues to be real. Hermeticity is only sufficient. And if the states are also eigenstates of the antilinear operator, then E is equal to E star and the energies are real. So the necessary condition is the Hamiltonian has to have an antilinear symmetry. The necessary and sufficient condition is that the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are also eigenstates of the antilinear operator. So when you see real eigenvalues, you shouldn't jump to the conclusion that the energies are necessarily real. Oh, that the Hamiltonian is necessarily Hermitian. Now, the, this work dates back to work by Bender and Betcher from 1998. They discovered that the P squared plus IX cube theory, which you would say categorically is not a Hermitian theory, nonetheless has all eigenvalues real because it's in this, it's in this antilinear uh, regime. Now, is there a preferred antilinear symmetry? Yes, assuming only two things, complex Lorentz invariance and probability conservation, you can show that the antilinear symmetry must be CPT. No need for hermeticity. Hermeticity had always been assumed in deriving the CPT theorem. And if C is invariant, which it is if, the, if we're dealing with the metric theory where G mu nu is just the metric, which is, has C even, then we default to CPT. Okay. Let me skip those two. Now, why do we need to continue into the complex plane in the first place? If I write down this Hamiltonian, the one we've been discussing, why, how, how could it possibly not be a Hermitian? It's a sum of Hermitian operators. Well, the answer is, when we say that a position or a momentum operator is Hermitian, we mean when they act on their own eigenstates. When they're acting on their own eigenstates, you can integrate by parts and throw away surface terms. However, that does not mean that when you act on the eigenstates of some other operator, such as the Hamiltonian, that you can still do that, you can still integrate by parts. And in fact, that's what happens. The, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are ones in which you cannot integrate by parts. And therefore, in that basis, the P and X operators are not Hermitian. So when would you ever have to care about this? When there's a mismatch between the states uh, the eigenbasis of the operators in the Hamiltonian and the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian itself. So we've not met this before, but it was, it was first recognized by Carl Bender and, and his collaborators, and it's a fairly reasonable uh, possibility in, in physics. Now, sorry, how, you, yes, sorry. But, uh, you have uh, four more minutes. Okay, so I think I, think I can get there. Right. So, just let me take the complex conjugate realization. And when I plug that in, the Hamiltonian stays real. So you would tell me this Hamiltonian must be, must, must be Hermitian, must have real eigenvalues. But it doesn't when you solve the problem. The energy eigenvalues are in complex conjugate pairs. In other words, you can't tell just by looking at the, at the Hamiltonian. So. Now, we have possibilities, real energies, complex conjugate energies. Between them, there's a transition point. At the transition point, the Hamiltonian becomes Jordan block. Namely, if you set omega 1 is omega plus epsilon, omega 2 is omega minus epsilon, e to the i omega 1t and e to the i omega t 2t both go to e to the i omega t. They collapse onto the same eigenfunction. That means we've lost an eigenstate. That means that the Hamiltonian is no longer diagonalizable. But where did the other state go? So take the difference and divide by epsilon. It becomes i t e to the i omega t. It's non-stationary. 
So in that limit, at that point where omega one is equal to omega two, remember that's the point where everything becomes singular, one of the states becomes non-stationary. But what Carl and I were able to show is that the set of stationary plus non-stationary states combined is still complete. The theory is still unitary. Probability is still conserved. And the Hamiltonian is such that it does not grow linearly in T. There is no runaway energy. You just have to use the correct Hamiltonian. Okay, so finally, we come to gravity. Yes, we are happy. We now agree that we can use the pauli villars propagator. We have, to, we have to construct this different Hilbert space that Carl and I have described, and that then we are unitary. But what happens when m1 squared equals m2 squared? Then we just come back to the pure one over k to the four theory, and that's the pure conformal gravity. And so conformal gravity is also unitary. It's also probability conserving, but it is non-diagonalizable. And if, it's, if the Hamiltonian is non-diagonalizable, it for sure can't be Hermitian. And in fact, it's PT symmetric. So now let me conclude by asking the following question. Why should anyone ever care about higher derivative gravity to begin with? Well, let's just take the, mass, the Dirac action for a massless fermion coupled to a background gravitational field, where you introduce the spin connection. It's been introduced to make the theory locally Lorentz invariant. Also, it turns out that it is locally conformal invariant. You didn't ask it to be, but it is. And so the standard theory, and you, this, this remains true if you put in the quantum, the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 quantum numbers, the standard theory is locally conformal invariant, except of course for the double well Higgs potential the only way to get around that is fermion masses have to be generated dynamically, and I've discussed that in a paper that was published recently. Now comes the final remark. So now let's take this fame, the action that we all use all the time and do the fermion path integral. I generate an effective action, and that effective action is the conformal gravity action, where C is a log divergent constant. Now, the standard model is ghost-free. Doing the fermion path integral in a background gravitational field cannot change the Hilbert space because it's just the same as a one-loop Feynman diagram in that gravitational field. And therefore, this theory must be ghost-free. It's ghost-free because you generate it by a one-radiative loop correction to a model that is already ghost-free. Therefore, conformal gravity must be ghost free. And if it were not, then the standard model wouldn't be unitary. If doing the path integral in a, in a background gravitational field were to produce ghosts, then the entire standard theory would collapse. So you have your choice. Either they both have ghosts or neither have ghosts. However, the conformal gravity theory is a non-diagonalizable theory and thus has a PT structure. And therefore, whether you like it or not, gravity forces PT symmetry on the standard model. To summarize, PT symmetry is quite ubiquitous in physics and cannot be avoided or ignored, especially in the standard model. To establish it or CPT symmetry only requires complex Lorentz invariance and probability con conservation. And if the theory of quantum gravity turns out to be conformal gravity, then one of the four fundamental forces in nature would be a PT theory. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. Are there any questions or comments? Let me ask one question. Sure. Uh, sure. What, is the, what is the classical limit uh, of this PT theory? What is it? Okay, so in the, in the conventional way of quantizing theories, you take, a, you take a classical Poisson bracket and you replace it by a commutator. Now, the commutation algebra is preserved under complex transformations. The classical Poisson bracket act, uh, um, 
Poisson brackets are preserved under classical symplectic transformations. So if you take the two theories and you make the same transformation in both, then you have a correspondence principle along a direction in the complex plane. Now, the only question you have is how do you know which, uh, which uh, direction to choose? Well, the answer is, in principle, it's true for every direction because every Poisson bracket transforms into every quantum commutator. However, it's not necessarily the case that the theory is well-defined in every direction. The classical theory, you have to write down the quantum path integral, and you need the measure to be such that the path integral exists. For these fourth order theories, that requires that the classical measure be be continued into the complex plane. The quantum theory, the same statement, is about wave functions and operators. When are they self-adjoint? They also have to be continued into the complex plane. And in this particular case, since the theory that I've discussed and the theory that, that you discussed earlier this morning are based on two oscillators, for oscillators, that correspondence is automatic. Okay, other questions or comments? Okay, I have a question. I'm Sandeep Sen Gupta. Can I ask? Uh, sure, sure, please. Okay, hi, Philip. Uh, you showed, a, uh, showed the Hamiltonian and there, uh, I think there was a linear term as well, something like ZPX or maybe XPZ, right? Every, uh, every, does it have? Every, every term was bilinear. It, there are always uh, yes, but, in an X. Yes, PZX, that's the term I'm concerned about. Does it, uh, so it is not necessarily uh, positive, right? Ah, that the, the, the point is, once we transform into this domain where everything is uh, convergent, then the Hamiltonian is a positive operator and all the eigenvalues are positive. But yes, each, each term on its own, would, there, there would be a problem with this one on its own and a problem with that one right. on its own. But yes. we, okay. we resolve everything by finding the correct domain in which all of these operators are self-adjoined. And it's, of course, okay. it's not trivial that there is such a domain. It, it's not okay, thank you. It wasn't guaranteed before we did the calculation. Sure, sure, thank you. The questions or comments? Actually, have a a question Thanks. for you, Philip. Um, so you said that uh, you have to insert this operator e to the minus q essentially in the yes. scalar product between states yes. in order to get the the right uh, norm. Yes. Uh, the question is: uh, Do you know if there are any consequences for? Uh, uh, inflationary perturbations because of this insertion. If you can uh, somehow get some, uh, you know, implication that can be tested, uh, for example. I, 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 I think so. Um, uh, but it's, I was going to make a comment on uh, Marco, Marco's talk because it actually is very much related. There's an entirely different way of formulating um, of formulating this theory, which is called pseudo-hermeticity. And you'll see in a moment, it's related to pseudo-unitarity, which is which you were just using for the inflationary model. You take an eigenstate, a right eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, take the conjugate, allow H not to be Hermitian, ID by DT of the norm is the matrix element of H minus H dagger. If H is not equal to H dagger, this norm is not conserved. So starting right from the beginning, if the Hamiltonian is not Hermitian, you can't use the Dirac norm. It doesn't even matter whether it's positive or negative. It's not time independent. So how do we find something that is time independent? We introduce an operator V, and I'm going to tell you what it is. You take the same calculation, and now instead of getting H minus H dagger, you get VH minus H dagger V. Let me see if, if V is invertible, then I have VH V to minus one is H dagger. And now what I need to do is I need to construct the bra minus ID by DT RV 
is r h dagger from there times v h dagger v is v h and i'm going to call r v l the left eigenstate and so this is the left eigenstate and so what you're looking for and this is what you should always do in a non hermitian theory is the norm should always be the overlap of the left eigenstate with the right eigenstate. To construct the left eigenstate, you need to construct the operator that implements this transformation, and that e to the minus q that I just showed you, we solved for explicitly in the PU model and determined it. And I would expect that the models that, um, that Alessandro and, and Marco talked about this morning, that you should be able to construct the V, if you're just working with, a, with, a, with oscillators, you might well be able to construct the V operator. And so that's the, the important object. And then later on, if V uh, it sends H to H dagger, and that's a similarity transformation, then H and H dagger have the same eigenvalues. And the eigenvalues are either real or in complex conjugate pairs. And therefore, this is the same condition as having an antilinear symmetry. Finally, the unitarity in this theory, since the unitary operator is e to the iht, it becomes v u v to minus one is u dagger. That's the unitarity condition. It's slightly different from the pseudo unitarity condition that was discussed earlier by Alessandro, that two imaginary of t is tht dagger. This is a different condition, and that's the unitarity condition which is the correct one. Now, to understand why, and I think this is why you have to do it always, we usually write the, um, we usually write the S matrix as the in, the in ket times the out bra. So now what you have to do, the generalization is it's the right in and the left out. And that's the correct, or that's the most general S matrix operator and I think if that, I think if you want to work with any theory, you you should uh, you should be using that that as the the most general. There is no uh, what I showed in one of my papers is there's no more general uh, in a product than left right because there's no more there's nothing more for a Hamiltonian to do than have a, a set of a set of ket states and a set of dual states. That that's it, and that defi once you define the ket the, the 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 state the space and the dual space, you've defined the theory. And so this is the most general. And yes, I believe that this may well be related to the inflationary discussions that we just heard a few minutes ago. Okay, thank you very much. So if there are no other questions or comments for all the speakers. Uh, uh, I would ask one question. Yes, please. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you can define, if you have the, have the have the drugs uh, the uh, Hilbert structure that gets uh, pros and gets that's different from the initial one. Why the, uh, why don't you start the theory with uh, uh, with the correct uh, Hilbert product instead of the one that you start with in which the Her uh, Hamiltonian is non Hermitian? Okay, the, the the answer to your question is because we didn't know. Oh, okay. See, <laughs> what we did was we followed our nose, we just did the normal things that you do, and we found that the wave function was not normalizable. That meant that something was not Hermitian. And at that point, we then had to figure out by a, a sequence of similarity transformations to find out what was the correct inner product. So the answer is yes, you always have to find the right inner product, all of this material, like this discussion I've given you here, that came a lot later. It was not, it was, I mean, Carl Bender and I solved the PU problem the way we did, and we constructed the, we did this analytic continuation to find the, the domain of convergence. Um, long before we had put this, uh, put this language of, of the V operator that, that I've just described, the answer, of course, is you, uh, and perhaps I can answer you generally, when you write down a Hamiltonian, I, say, I said before, you can't tell if it is Hermitian by inspection. That, that was the important point. Hermeticity cannot be established by inspection. However, 
symmetry can, antilinear symmetry can be. So if you have a Hamiltonian and you know it's antilinear because you can show it, show it, then you know that the correct inner product is the overlap of the ket with its antilinear conjugate bra. It may turn out to be that that is the Hermitian conjugate because Hermitian conjugation is also antilinear. So it, anti, antilinear is not excluding hermeticity. Hermeticity is the special case. So the rule that we're saying is always look to see if there's an antilinear symmetry. If there isn't, guarantee not all the eigenvalues are real. Then you know the inner product is the overlap of the state with its, anti, with its antilinear symmetry conjugate. And if that turns out to be the Dirac norm, then you're just back to regular hermeticity. So the answer is yes, that's the correct procedure. That's the general procedure. And unfortunately, the way hermeticity was developed, hermeticity is sufficient to give real eigenvalues and sufficient to give probability conservation, but is not necessary. And the, the whole PT program has filled in the necessary piece. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. Hi, you're very welcome. So it's already quite late. So I would uh, thank all the speakers for their contribution and very interesting talks and the audience for attending. So see you next time for the next uh, Newton 1665 seminars. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye, thank you. Bye. Bye. Yep. Bye. -bye.